Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. Patreon-sponsored review time again! So, uh... Moomins! Yeah, I know all about, uh... Nothing. I know nothing about them. It's Ignorant American time again, too! I've made it no secret over the years that my interests are... not expansive. Sci-fi, fantasy, horror, but a lot of it being mainstream American stuff. I've got some niche stuff in there, a few non-American but popular franchises like The Ring or Doctor Who. But especially when it comes to comic books, I like American superheroes. I like the Marvel and DC stuff. And that's pretty much it. It's not that I hate anything that doesn't fit those molds, it's just that it usually doesn't interest me. And that bugs some people, this belief that if something is of high quality, you should be embracing it wholeheartedly, absorbing it into the blob of your fan interests that's occupied by so much else. For me, it's like a food thing. I enjoy pasta fine, I am occasionally in the mood to make and eat some pasta, and I am satisfied afterwards when eating it, but I'm not seeking it out all the time, and even when it's great, it's rarely something I find to be what I want to consume multiple times a week. That I reserve for chicken tenders. But yeah, therein lies the point. Patreon-sponsored reviews have gotten me to look at a number of very popular European franchises and comics. Dan Dare, Biggles, Asterix, and now Moomins, something I didn't know existed until a few years ago, but has been a thing since 1945. The Moomins comes to us from Finland, both the name and design of these hippo-looking things apparently deriving from one aesthetic. Softness. According to the Wikipedia article, these beings are actually trolls, which, if accurate and not just someone putting that in there for a joke, would not have been my first guess, so kudos on originality, especially with the softness thing. Not something you associate with the word troll. Although now I envision internet trolls having very soft insults like, I find your work unpleasant, instead of, go kill yourself. And again, if accurate, it does make me question the name of the main protagonist of this group, Moomin Troll. I'd like to introduce you to my son, Person Human. Moomin Troll, or just Moomin in some translations apparently, is the son of Moomin Papa and Moomin Mama, and they live in a weird little fairy tale esque world with some other eccentric characters in Moomin Valley. Since these other characters are not Moomins themselves, seems kind of egotistical to name the whole valley after just your species, but what do I know? In any case, while Moomins had their start in children's novels, they've been adapted into various other mediums, including comic strips. However, that's not what we're looking at today. Moomins and the Comet Chase was released in 2010, but not originally made then. The movie is actually one of those compilation films, taking several episodes of the 1977 Polish stop-motion animated Moomin series and putting them together. And since it was 2010, it got a conversion into stereoscopic 3D. Which was the style at the time? The movie's in widescreen, so I do wonder if they just trimmed the top and bottom to do that, or if it was originally filmed in 16x9 and then cut to 4x3 for broadcast. Or was Poland way ahead of the curve in the 70s and did widescreen TV back Back then. Unlike a lot of other TV show to movie compilations though, this at least was its own storyline, an adaptation of the second Moomin's book, Comet in Moomin Land. Do not assume that I'll be comparing it to the book though, I already don't know enough about this franchise as it is. Besides, that's Dominic Noble's territory anyway. Man, what a weird waste of a callback to a cameo. So we've got an English translation of a Polish movie compiled from episodes of a 70s TV show adapted from a Finnish novel. I love reviews that let me write sentences like that. Let's dig into Moomins and the Comet Chase and see how this all works.
Well, after G4 collapsed that second time, they needed to downgrade. Our opening credits feature some little stop-motion creatures in space, presumably a couple with their child, playing around and eventually hugging on a fried egg, which in turn folds in on them to form into an egg and then hatching the three again. Appropriately for such a weird concept, the opening theme is being sung by Bjork. And at the risk of alienating fans of hers... Yeah, I don't like the song. It sounds weird and atonal and disjointed. More a collection of experimental musical ideas rather than something catchy. I'm not exactly a follower of Bjork, so maybe that's something people like about it, but it's not for me. I do appreciate that she's apparently a huge fan of the Moomins and wrote the song specifically for this movie, but I do question the creative decision to have the lyrics rhyme Comet with Damn It. I know, that's not me exaggerating for a joke. That's the actual lyrics. Anyway, we truly open on some scenic images of Moomin Valley and the narration of Max von Sydow. As the first rays of the summer sun brought all the colors to life. Uh, yeah, that's nice and pleasant, Max, but do you think you could bring up the intensity of your performance a bit? The power of Christ compels you! Thank you, that'll do it. He informs us that today, however, a gray color had fallen on everything in the valley. Not metaphorically, but rather something gray was indeed covering everything. Yeah, there was an accident with the Moomin Valley construction crew and their asbestos cleanup. Moomin Troll wakes up, unable to tell if it's day or night because of the gloomy atmosphere. The rose bush is all gray. It's covered in dust. Moomins and the Swiffer Sheet Chase. Seeking wisdom for how this could have happened, Moomin Troll goes to see Mr. Muskrat, who's apparently napping, yet somehow not getting a layer of dust on him, and asks him how this could have happened. Well, who's to say? Who knows what things will look like in the last days before the end of the world? Mr. Muskrat's a real glass half full kind of dude. Maybe the problem is that the animators put everything in storage for a while and it got dusty. Moomin Troll informs his parents of all this, particularly that the end of the world is coming, showing his mother the dusty flower bushes. Now, Moomin Troll, did you do this? Yeah, Mom, I emptied the vacuum cleaner bag outside and it just got out of hand. Come on! Moomin Mama suggests that Muskrat is just exaggerating the severity of the problem and they should have breakfast. As they sit down, though, the Muskrat enters. The Muskrat was a philosopher. Unfortunately, he was mostly a follower of Spinoza and thus was often contradictory and insufferable. He read big books and thought deep thoughts. They were actually recipe books and said deep thoughts were, I wonder if I can make meatloaf into pudding. They invite him to sit down and eat, though he explains what it is he's concerned about. Ominous signs in the sky of... something. He offhandedly mentions that if a comet were to hit the Earth and destroy it, that it wouldn't make any real difference in the grand scheme of the universe, which Moomin Troll and Sniff, a rodent-like being who is friends of the family, take to mean that indeed a comet is heading to wipe them all out. Moomin Papa reassures him that that's unlikely. And he's right. The odds of a comet hitting the Earth are quite literally astronomically small, using the metaphor of Moomin Troll being unable to roll some pebbles into some objects on the ground. Point being that it's very hard for a comet to hit the Earth. But what, what if it's angry? Well, if Rick and Morty taught us anything, it's that comets only get pissed off if there are dinosaurs around. So you're probably a, Wait. Are trolls related to dinosaurs? Realizing that Muskrat got inside the children's heads, Moom and Papa suggests they take a trip to the local observatory to reassure them that everything's fine. But first, we have to build a raft for the river trip. Oh god, thus was born the horrifying story of the raft of the Moom and Moomin Papa had been to sea, so he knew all about building a raft. He somehow sank a lot of boats he was on. Anyway, after the raft is completed, they rest for the night. That night, the stars twinkled brightly, just as they had always done. Thanks, Max. Any other bits of information you can tell us that we can just presume to be the case? Perhaps inform us of the presence of oxygen and whether gravity is still functioning. With the raft done, Moomin Troll and Sniff begin their river adventure. Uh, wait. Why isn't Moom and Papa coming along? Isn't he the guy with experience at sea? Do these kids even know where the observatory is? Hell, they didn't even know what an observatory was until yesterday. If you see an odd building with a round roof, that will be the observatory. Either that or a football stadium. Whatever gets you out of our hair for a few days. After passing by some creatures called Hattafatners, the two come across a tent on the shore occupied by Tom Bombadil here. Actually, this is a humanoid friend of theirs, Snuffkin. Welcome. I was hoping we might 
bump into each other. I forgot to pack a lunch, and, well, here you are. After telling Snuffkin about their mission to the observatory, Sniff reveals that he doesn't actually know what a comet is. Comet is a star that has gone crazy. There's a lot of lead poisoning in space. The further explanation about a comet does not help Sniff's mood, especially about what happens if the comet comes to them. Disaster, the Earth will be smashed to pieces. Still a nice day for it. To take their minds off their impending doom, Snuffkin takes them up the side of a hill to look down at a crevice full of gemstones. They ask him if they belong to him. The way I see it, I can own anything on Earth, even the Earth itself. I see that Snuffkin's other name is Moomin Capitalist. Snuffkin says that Sniff can have as many of the Garnet Stones as he wants, and he proceeds to gather up a lot until he's confronted by this dragon. So when Snuffkin says that he can own anything he wants, what he really meant was, I'm gonna steal from Smaug. He's chased out of the cave, and he laments that he wasn't able to get a single one of the stones. Life gets complicated when you want to own things. I'd say that he's wrong, but I gotta pay a mortgage. The next morning, they proceed on their journey with Snuffkin joining the party. The river rapids increase in intensity, and they're sent off course, going over a brook into a tunnel in the mountain, which eventually breaks off their mast and wedges them near the end. Sniff laments how the adventures he goes on with Moomin Troll always seem to go like this. Listen, Sniff. Our adventures always end safely. We have main character shield, Sniff. Nothing's gonna happen to us. They spot a hole in the cave ceiling, but it's too high up to reach. As such, Snuffkin decides to play on his flute to cheer the other two up. A guy up top, identified as a Hemulin, helps get them out before the raft is destroyed, though they manage to salvage some of their supplies. After another camp out for the night, the narrator informs us that they reach the Lonely Mountains. Oh crap, maybe it was Smaug that Sniff ran into. They spot the observatory on the highest peak of the mountains and begin their hike up. As they proceed, they arrive at a cliffside and spot a golden ring down below. It's an ankle bracelet belonging to a friend of theirs, Snork Maiden, and they suspect it fell off of her while she was picking flowers. Moomin Troll says they need to retrieve it for her. I've got to get it for her. She'll be lost without it. Don't know why she installed a GPS in it, but still. Shockingly, they retrieve it without serious incident. The rope gets tangled in a branch, but it's easily solved. And they continue on their way. A storm brews, including this weird thing that I'm pretty sure is either Starscream Spark or SF Debris in his natural form. And then the storm just dissipates? Or they manage to get above the clouds while seeking shelter? Man, Moomin Troll was right, their adventures do always end safely. Every setback just kind of solves itself. Once they reach the observatory, and that flaming ball of death that seems to be hovering around there, the narrator informs us that the group loses their nerve to go in together, instead drawing lots to see who goes inside to talk to the scientists. Moomin Troll draws the short stick and heads in. The scientists were completely engrossed in their astronomical calculations and didn't hear a thing. I'm telling you, man, I looked at the moon and there was a bald guy up there with a dog harvesting cheese! Unfortunately, when he finally gets their attention, all he learns is that Snork Maiden was indeed there earlier asking about the ankle bracelet. This relieves Moomin Troll, who was worried she had fallen off the cliff. Something he had not expressed before, nor did he see any signs of a body near the bracelet, so I don't know when he got worked up about that. But yeah, he forgot to ask about the comet, so Sniff goes in to try asking about it himself. He gets to see the comet, and indeed, it's heading right for Earth. The others come in to hear of when the comet will hit. The comet will reach the Earth in four days, four hours, four minutes, and 44 seconds. Mind you, my calculator is broken, and only the four button works, so... The group quickly heads out to return to home, wanting to warn the adults of the impending extinction event. Oh, the comet, the comet. Mama and Papa will take care of that. They've been wanting to try their new death ray. They rush down the mountain, Sniff whining along the way in fear of everything and the heavy load of the tent. I will say that while Sniff has been kind of annoying with his complaining, cowardice, and greed, it hasn't been to the point of hating the character. And I think it's nice that while Snuffkin and Moomin Troll occasionally roll their eyes at his attitude, they're not mean or cruel to him over any of it. I think that's a good lesson for kids. Yeah, some other kids might be kind of irritating, but you don't have to be an absolute asshole to them in turn. That being said, Snuffkin suggests that if the tent is too heavy, then maybe he should just toss it aside. After all, one shouldn't grow too attached to their own possessions. Moomin Troll agrees with this, and indeed, he tosses the tent over the edge of the cliff. 
I'd like to remind you that they've already lost their transportation that made this journey easier and still have at least two days travel back home now without any shelter, so... That's a bad lesson for kids. Some possessions are good to be at least a little attached to, is all I'm saying. While taking a rest and playing with some rocks, Moomin Troll falls over the edge. And I might have to retract what I said about Sniff almost immediately, because as he recovers from Vertigo, he does not at all notice Moomin Troll going over, even though he can hear them yelling about it. Still, once he realizes what's up, he helps them up. But what the hell, dude? Anyway, they realize once again how close the comet is getting and resume their journey. If you're going to be struck by a comet, it is nicer to be at home when it comes. Yeah, you say that, but then it turns out you didn't get the groceries this week, so you're just sitting around waiting for the end without anything to munch on. They run into the Hemulin again, discovering that the rocks that they've been tossing over the edge earlier actually hit him in the head, so... Whoops. Points to Snuffkin for not trying to cover his ass over it and openly confessing, though the guy walks off in a huff. However, they soon have other things to worry about as the stream near them suddenly dries up. What's more, their compass stops working. Though Snuffkin isn't worried. Moss only grows on the north side of trees, so they can use that as a natural compass. Moss grows anywhere on a tree as long as there's nearby water. You three are going to get further lost and then eaten by a bear. They soon discover Snork Maiden and her brother under attack by some kind of killer tree. Don't worry, I know a guy who can help. This game is really beginning to heat up. The tree also has eyeballs that blink in and out of existence, so there's your good old-fashioned nightmare fuel for the day. Moomin Troll distracts it by hurling the harshest insults he can think of at it. You flat foot liberty give it. You're as ugly as crumbled wrapping paper! That ant may kill him, but the psychological harm from those words is going to haunt this tree for the rest of its days. Turned every one of its angry red eyes on Moomin Troll. Quick, give him Dutch Elm disease! Great, the comet's gonna kill everyone, and now he's got a bunch of splinters. Who knew this movie was a stealth sequel to From Hell It Came? So, were the eyeballs like fruit for the tree, or actual sensory organs? Glad to see the tree from Poltergeist had a long career, even if it was typecast. Given the naming conventions of this franchise, shouldn't we be calling it Moomin Tree? You know, maybe wildfires are good, actually. This is why you shouldn't carve your initials into a tree. It may take it personally. Oh, dude, don't damage the tree. Lawyers love tree laws. You're gonna get sued. You know, call me a party pooper, but I'm just not seeing the appeal of a real living Christmas tree. God, I hate it when trees play keep away. Guess we should change the expression to make like a tree and grab somebody. This is the end result of Mr. Burns shoving that nuclear waste into the trees. The Lorax ain't speaking for the trees anymore. The only language they know now is violence. And finally, don't worry guys, it's bark is worse than it's bite. Can you believe there are people out there who don't think I'm hilarious? Moomin Troll manages to fight it off armed only with a pocket knife. Once the thing dies, he returns the ankle bracelet to Snork Maiden. Her brother, who has apparently just named Snork, go figure, is concerned about the comet, and they join in in the fellowship of the ankle ring. But first, a quick detour on the way back to the valley at a store for supplies. Snork wants a new notebook, preferably with grid paper. One never tires of squares, does one? How did all these squares make a circle? They get some stuff, particularly new pants for Snufkin. Snork Maiden gets a medal for Moomin Troll for rescuing her, and he gives her a mirror because she's so vain that she wants to look at herself in puddles, but now doesn't have to. But then they realize they have no money. That's okay though, Snufkin returned the pants, which the store owner says equals the cost of everything else and thus makes it even, even though he didn't actually buy them. I don't think the store is going to be in business much longer. On the plus side though, she still got pants. As they continue on, we learn that the heat of the comet is affecting the area. They approach a seashore without any sea. All the water has vanished. Why is the sea gone? And who was phone? Oh, Lapis Lazuli, that's not how you get back to homeworld. Snufkin is particularly distressed about this, but Moomin Troll is optimistic. It'll come okay. back, Snufkin. I'm sure it will. We've got to hit the reset button at the end of these episodes after all. With the water gone though, they're not sure how to get across the vast empty area. I know, I know, why don't we fly? There is logic in what he says. 
Not sure why they can't just walk across the bottom of the sea since it's empty, but whatever. Snufkin recommends they make stilts to walk on, give themselves longer strides, and to avoid any cracks in the surface. They soon come across a wrecked ship. Oh hey, they found the wreck of the HMS Terror! Movement Troll, see if you can finally get the captain's logbook. That's gonna solve a few historical mysteries. Sniff finds a gold sword with jewels on it and plays around with it, accidentally sending Snork Maiden into the wreck. Movement Troll quickly goes in to help her. He gets her out, but is then attacked by a giant octopus. Fortunately, Snork Maiden drives it out by reflecting light off the mirror directly into the thing's eyes. Snork Maiden! Now you saved my life! Oh crap, now I gotta go back to the store to get you a medal. The next morning, they continue on. You know what? I don't think we need these stilts anymore. Why did you need them in the first place? They come across other creatures fleeing Moomin Valley, Mr. Muskrat apparently having told everyone that that's where the comet is going to hit. However, they say that Moomin Mama and Papa are still there waiting for them, so our heroes proceed. They soon find another Hemulin, this one obsessed with stamp collecting, and inform him of the danger, but also invite him to come along to hopefully find safety in Sniff's cave where he lives. And thus the party walks on. As if things couldn't get any more apocalyptic, a swarm of locusts soon come in and start eating the forest. A tornado starts up next, but Snufkin realizes they can use the Hemulin's dress as a sail to blow them the rest of the way. Of course! Don't you know anything about science? They land in a tree and, exhausted from this latest escapade, fall asleep in it. Now on the final day, they reach home. They fill in Mama and Papa about what happened on their little adventure and soon get ready to head to Sniff's cave, though Mr. Muskrat warns them there's no escaping the Comet. Maybe we should call you Mr. Buzzkill instead. They quickly take what they can and evacuate to the cave, Mr. Muskrat soon asking to join them since it's too hot in his hammock. But hey, nothing to worry about, that curtain will protect them from the impact. Just to continue his trend of being unpleasant, Mr. Muskrat accidentally sits on a cake. Now I shall be sticky for the rest of my life, I suppose. What's worse is, those could very well be your last words. Sniff goes out to retrieve his pet cat, but he takes so long that Moomin Troll goes after him. The comet is almost on them, and they quickly get back inside after finding it. Stickiness and misery! Twitter's new slogan. However, the comet doesn't hit. Rather, it arcs away from the ground and flies off. The comet probably just brushed us with its tail, and then zipped into space again. Oh, of course that makes sense! I mean, I... What?! The water soon returns to the sea, and everything begins to, you know, no longer be an apocalyptic wasteland. And so our movie ends with the narrator saying that they more deeply appreciated the things they had. And also that they really should go home and have some tea and pancakes. Oh, and the weird creatures from the opening credits are now in the ending credits watching said credits roll by. This movie is good, though it's also kind of weird. And I don't mean because of the odd creatures or anything like that, but rather the weird tone it has and the odd plot points that don't actually go anywhere. Now, admittedly, this is probably thinking too much about a movie that's a compilation of a bunch of old TV show episodes and plot points are not really something that needs to be nitpicked and analyzed, but I just find it weird that throughout this adventure, they keep running into obstacles and said obstacles are immediately dealt with right up to the end. Wherein the thing that they've been worried about, the actual end of the world and what can come from that, is itself just resolved with a shrug from the end of the world. The comet just veers away before hitting. I don't know, the movie follows very much a childlike logic to everything already, going on adventures through the woods, thinking everything will work out, getting easily distracted, but also focused on the people they love and care about, thinking their parents will solve everything, playing around or getting sidetracked. So maybe the idea of the comet being alive was right and it chooses to veer off instead of hitting. But I feel like that should have been more explicit in the ending. The weirdness also comes across a bit because of tone. While it has that fairy tale, childlike logic atmosphere going for it throughout, the impending doom of the world grows increasingly as the movie goes on. I kind of expected there to be a big fake out, like the comet was much smaller than they thought, or it'd break up in the atmosphere, or it would turn out to be a UFO carrying those creatures from the credits. You know, a chicken little the sky is falling kind of thing, where the children were just overreacting. But no, especially as the comet gets closer and closer, it really does 
does feel like something apocalyptic is happening, and we're seeing it through innocent eyes that don't understand the full implications of it. I honestly kind of half expected it to get really dark in the end with death and horror, even though I knew this wasn't the friggin' end of the Moomins franchise, and it's not that kind of story. Admittedly, that could just be me looking at it through modern, more jaded eyes. Like I said, it's still good, and it captures a kind of youthful wonder about the world and the magic of everything around our heroes, and I love that. I'm already a fan of stop-motion animation, but I especially love the style they used here. The mixture of painted backgrounds and set decorations, while the stop-motion puppets only have parts of them that are three-dimensional, help create a very children's storybook feeling that I find very refreshing and cute. The decision to not have any animated mouths was a good one, in my opinion. Not only because it makes for easier dubbing, but also creates a unique artistic style to it all, forcing us to focus on the eyes of the characters, which are bright and big and full of wonder. And like I said, the slow transition from the colorful forest to the dark desolation of the impending disaster was very well done and felt natural as it went along. It's a good movie, well animated and interesting to watch, but it's got some weird padding to it, probably owing itself to starting life as a TV show, though it still feels weird for a TV show, too. Nice that everything got a happy ending, and it's overall a pleasant piece of media. The same cannot be said for the Patreon-sponsored review next time. It's Avengers Disassembled. A single comet could wipe us out, just like that. Perhaps you could retire to the hammock and do some private thinking. Or maybe you could stop wandering into our house, scaring my children, eating our food, and get a job! What the hell is a philosophy degree good for anyway? Hello, my friends. Please take a moment to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and click the bell for notifications on new video releases. If you'd like to support future videos, you can check out my Patreon, buy merch from the store envy link in the description, or check out the t-shirts available from Teespring. Thanks for watching.